This morning, we're going to take a short look into the life of one of the great men of all times. Everybody say Daniel. He was a prophet statesman. Dan- now, listen to me. This is a, sort of like a, a, a statement that I wrote about Daniel's life that I thought was cool. Daniel learned how to influence the hand, both the hand of God and the hand of man through prayer and fasting. Daniel was not an innocent bystander in his life. How many people have ever felt like you're a victim being tossed to and fro? Daniel learned literally how to move the hand of God and how to move the hand of mighty men, kings, who ruled the world. He learned how to move their hand through prayer and fasting. Now we see in chapter 1, Daniel comes onto the scene. Um, He's... I think he's about 17 years old. I think um, realistically he would be, it doesn't say how old he is, but he would be between 15 and 20 years old. Okay, I think he was 17 years old. I think he was born on February 13th. No, I'm only kidding. Okay, but I think he was approximately, in chapter 1, I think he's approximately 17 years old. What's so cool about that, as we open the pages of his life, we see at 17 years old, he was a man of deep conviction and deep religious devotion. He got it young. Don't don't ever say you're too old to get it or too young to get it. As as a young man, he was a man with principle. As a young man, he was a man that knew what was right and did what was right and stood for what was right. As a young man, he wouldn't bow to to the ways of the world, to the pressure of his culture. As a young man, he decided to follow his God, period. And that's what God's looking for today, people that are going to follow God, period. Hallelujah. What I'm seeing in the American church is I'm seeing such a, a, a movement of a mixture between, um, between American culture and really sinful, lustful living and, and Christianity. And God is calling for a people that will be holy. God is calling for a people that will stand for righteousness. You know... When I was a young person in Christ, I don't know who I heard it from, but I heard this statement that others can, but I can't. And, and it was described to me that there's a place in your spiritual life where you say, I'm not just going to do, I'm not looking for a way out of living for Jesus. I'm not going to just take on patterns of worldliness just because it's allowed. I am going to seek God for what is the most pure way of living, the the most hard after God. I'm not going to live my life. Others can. I'm not going to judge you. You might think that that's okay. Others can, but I choose not to. Why? I choose to go to walk a higher level. I choose to follow God in a deeper way. Why? Because I want his power. I want his kingdom. I want to know him. I want to live close to him. I'm not looking for what I can get away for. I'm not looking for that which would please my personal flesh the most. You know, just live enough in Christ that you go to heaven, but just take on as much of this culture that pleases you. No, I want to see God. Is there any amens in this house? Is there anybody here that says, I'm going to live for Jesus, even when it's not convenient, even when it's not popular, even when I don't want to, I'm going to follow God. Daniel was that kind of guy. Hallelujah. He had deep conviction and deep religious devotion. Hallelujah. And so in chapter 1, we see um, that he's about 17 years old. We're going to start our study this morning in chapter 6, however. And believe it or not, in chapter 6, 68 years have passed. Nebuchadnezzar is no longer king. It's now under King Darius. Daniel is now 85 years old. And let's read. Chapter 6, verse 1. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. Satrap was a part of uh, uh, a political leader in that country. Verse 2. And over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, 
and these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. So Darius was putting, um, instituting new levels of organization. There'd be 120 leaders, and they would answer to three leaders, one of which would be Daniel. It says in verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel began to distinguish himself among, co- the, among the commissioners and the satraps, because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Do you understand what's happening? Daniel is about ready to become um, Joseph, like Joseph was to Pharaoh, second in command, ruler over a great and mighty nation, a worldwide nation. Hallelujah. Babylon at that time and Persia at that time was in control of the world. And, and one of God's children was about ready to be exalted to second in command. Verse 4, it says, Then the commissioners and the satraps began to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no grounds. Listen to this. I love this. They could find no grounds of accusation or evidence or corruption. Inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Somebody say, O Lord, let it be in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He had... He had the greatest minds of the greatest nation of that time trying to find one way to trap him up. He had had his whole life and his whole administration under a microscope because all these great minds that were helping run the nation were trying to find one way where they can accuse him. And they couldn't. You know why? Because the same guy who lived right before God lived right before man. And if we're going to become men of God and men of prayer, we need to work hard and do things in the right way. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Do you ever hear the adage, you should go to work early, get there before you have to? Others can get there right on the bell, but I'm going to get there a little early. Get myself ready. I'm going to work a little harder. I'm going to dot my I's and cross my T's, which is a whole lot better than crossing my I's and dotting my T's. Somebody say amen. That was a man Daniel was. They could find no fault in him. Verse 5, and these men, were not, will, these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him in regard to the laws of God. And so what they did is they figured out, unless they can find something he does for God regularly, they'll never be able to accuse him. So they went to the king with trickery and deceit. And they had the king write a law. And they wrote a law that said for 30 days, nobody is allowed to pray to any other God but to King Darius. For 30 days. And so they wrote that into the law of the, of the, the, law of, the, of, the of Babylon, of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be broken. And so when Daniel found out about that, this is what Daniel did. Verse 10. It says, now when Daniel knew that the document was signed... He entered his house. Now his roof chamber had, a wi- had windows open towards Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as had been, he had been doing previously. It says in the New King James, it says, And he knelt down on his knees three times that day, and prayed and gave thanks before God, as was his custom, since, early, since the early days. And from the, the NLT, it says, and he prayed three times a day, just that he has always done, giving thanks to God. I love it. He prayed three times a day. It says, as he was previously doing, as he was custom doing, as he had always done. Daniel, from his earliest administration, from his earliest walk with God, decided to set minimum prayer goals. You know what's cool about this? It, nowhere in the, does it say in the Bible that you have to pray three times a day. This was Daniel's decision, okay? There's no laws on how much to pray or how much not to pray. We're calling for 21 days of prayer and fasting. You could go to heaven and not come to one of our prayer meetings. No one has to do anything. But we're calling you to inside, decide to make some commitments, personal commitments and personal goals to seek a holy God. Three times a day. How many people know if you set your heart to have three sections of prayer every day, you'll pray more than if you have one time? 
Let me give you two simple times before you go to bed and as you wake up. That's two. It shouldn't be easy to find another time. God called Daniel to be a man of prayer, and, and he set the minimum of our prayers three times a day. There are, um, we, we, we know the story. Daniel continued to pray. Um, the king, the, the men who helped the king write this law um, ratted on Daniel that he was praying. The king tried to find a loophole not to throw him into the lion's den. But that was the law, that if you prayed to another god for those 30 days, that you'd be thrown into the lion's den. And the king didn't want to because he knew that, that he had been tricked and trapped. And, and he knew that Daniel was a, a righteous man. Hallelujah. But he, he could not find a loophole, and he had to throw Daniel into the lion's den. Everybody cried. But let me ask you a question. If you're a man of prayer... And if you're being thrown into a lion's den because of your prayer commitment, do you think God's going to let you get swallowed up and spit, spit out? That's not what happened. God sent an angel, and an angel clothed the, ma- the mouths of those lions. And just so you don't think that those lions weren't really hungry, as soon as the king saw them, he let them stay in there the whole night. And the king called them out, and he came out. And then all those other three people, those other people that helped the king write the law, he threw them and their families into the lion pit. And it says that the, the, the lions were so ravenous that they literally crushed them. But for the man of prayer, God... Close the mouth of the lion. Hallelujah. How many people need some, some, some lion mouth closing angels to come in your life? Come on. How many people know that, that that's, a, that's not like a, a, you know, a, 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 a level one trial. That's a level 100 trial, a level 10 trial, depending on your scale here. That's big time. How many people know that you don't want to be chilling in a lion pit with hungry lions? You know what I mean? That ain't no fun. You know, we're not talking about lion taming. We're talking about lion's lunch. Okay? But for a man of prayer, there's no fear. There are four big major lessons that I learned from this little story. Is the first one is practice consistent prayer. Have daily prayer goals. Let me tell you, if you wait for your schedule to, um, to, to make room for prayer, I'm looking at you, I'm saying, you're going to have to have a snowboard accident or something like that. I didn't say that, though. Um, I am mean. That was Tiffany hurt herself snowboarding really bad. <laughs> and so you guys keep her in prayer. Can you say amen? Okay. Um, I'm not asking you to wait for your schedule to clear up. Everybody say the word sacrifice. I'm asking you for 21 days to make some sacrifices. I'm asking you to move some things around. One of the things that I do that I'm planning on moving around is I go to the gym three times a week. Can't you tell? Okay, for these 21 days, and it's a sacrifice. I'm not going to go to gym. I'm going to be taking, besides other times, I'm going to be taking that time for prayer. Okay, one of my nitsy things that I do, I'll be working, and how many people know that after a while working on the computer and working on sermons, studying and stuff like that, you get a little bl- brain freeze. So one of the things I do, I'm not a gamer, but there's one game that every now and then I'll pre- play just to sort of relieve my brain. And that'll be solitaire. That's big time. Old school solitaire, not spider solitaire. Just simple down the board. How many people know you got to be careful for the temptation of solitaire? And, um, but I'll use it just as a brain relief. Well, for 21 days, I'm going to try not to play solitaire. You know what I mean? I, um, what? Look at you, Harry. You're going on a mission. You're worried about <laughs> playing solitaire. But no, now I'm not telling anybody to do those things. But what I'm saying is I'm looking at my schedule over these next 21 days and I'm seeing how can I, how can I structure my schedule to take the most time in prayer, to have the most time in, my, in reading the scriptures and the most time seeking God. And so I am being strategic in the things that are in my life that I'm choosing. I don't have to do this. I don't do it because I'm a pastor. I do it because I want more of God. Can you say Amen. And so I'm asking you to do the same thing. You don't have to make any decisions, but I'm asking you to think about it and pray about it. So the first thing he did is he practiced consistent prayer. Hallelujah. Daily prayer. And God wants us to make prayer a habit and have patterns. The second thing, he he did not let anybody or anything keep him from prayer. How lame are our excuses? 
Here he had the greatest minds of that nation write a law to try to keep him from prayer. And the punishment, if he would go to pray, would be death. And he didn't even allow that to pray. Now, the next time you have a reason not to pray, put that up to Daniel's, and he didn't let that stop him from prayer. Is it, do you understand that logic? Okay. He could have died, but that didn't stop him. He was committed to seek the face of God. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not second, not third in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Hallelujah. Somebody say it with me. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to seek God. God is calling us. God is stirring something in the spirit realm. And yes, it will involve Real sacrifice. But it will come from your heart, not from anybody else. And nobody has to, but we get to. Hallelujah. The third thing that I see is that a man of prayer will be a man of morals and excellence. If you'll become a man of prayer, he will increase your morality. And if there's areas in your life where you question your morality, you question your lifestyle, I can almost guarantee you if you up the level of prayer, the level of prayer will have a, a corresponding effect of upping your level of holy morality. Somebody say amen. And, then, uh, and also of excellence in what you do. If you, how many people here have ever been sloppy in what they've done and you didn't care? It's like, oh, it's like get by, say so, uh, it's good enough. Hallelujah. How many people know good enough might be good enough? but it's not good enough to get your head. It might be good enough for you to survive. It might be good enough for you to get by, but it's not necessarily good enough for you to have success. And God is calling us, and prayer will up even the level of ability at work. Well, I don't care whether it's a religious job or a spiritual, or a, just a practical job. The prayer will make you a better nurse, it will make you a better teacher, it will make you a better doctor, it will be make you a better construction worker, it will make you a better administrator, it will make you a better mother, it will make you a better father. Whatever you do, whatever you're investing your life in, prayer will make you better at it. How many people can testify that prayer has helped them in every area of their lives? And the, the fourth thing is that, that a man of prayer will be a man that prospers. Now, I'm not talking about how expensive the car in your driveway will be. I'm talking about deep prosperity. I'm talking about things that really matter where we live our lives. Can you say amen? I mean, I, I, would rather, I would rather a million times prosper as a parent than I would in my bank account. Now, I believe God will bless my bank account. But how many people know those are the things that really bless us? And God will cause us to prosper. Hallelujah. The more you pray, the more God will bless the work of your hands. Is there an amen in the house? Amen. So... That was the, the first part that I wanted to look at in Daniel's life. It was when he was 85. It's in chapter 6. It's a story most of us know. It's Daniel being thrown in the lion's den. He was thrown in the lion's den because he would not waver. His moral conviction was sure. He was going to pray. He didn't pray more. He just kept praying like he's always prayed three times a day. I would like us to go to chapter 9 and, and look at another story about Daniel. Now, it's interesting. We just went from chapter 6, and now we're going to chapter 9. And I need to tell you, from a historical point of view, we're traveling two years in the past. Okay. How many people know that the Bible is not completely win, written in chronological order? And as you study, you can see the timelines that are there. So chapter 9 happened two years prior to chapter 6. Just for your information. It says in the first year of Darius, the same king, but now we're going to the first year. The first year the king of Darius was made king. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books of the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Everybody say 70 years. You know what Daniel's doing? He's not only committing himself to prayer, he's reading his Bible. Everybody say a good idea. Hallelujah. He's reading the book of, say Jeremiah. Very good. Okay. He's reading the book of Jeremiah. And as he's reading the book of Jeremiah, he's actually reading Jeremiah chapter 25. It jumps out at him. 
and he grabs hold of him. Now, before I tell you how he jumps out of him and grabs hold of him, how many people would like to go with me to Jeremiah chapter 25 to read what Daniel read? Everybody say, yes, I would, Pastor. Help me out here. Okay, Jeremiah 25, verse 8. This is what Daniel read all those years ago. Now, just to give you some information, um, when this occasion happened that was being prophesied, Daniel, I'm sorry, Jeremiah had already been prophesying that this was going to happen for like 23 years. For 23 years, he was speaking to the nation of Israel that if they don't repent, there would be judgment. That if they don't forsake their idols, there was going to be judgment and that their nation would be destroyed. And oh, how many people know God, when God warns, he warns more than once. And God over and over and over. And this is what he writes in verse 24. He says, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you had not obeyed my word, behold, I am send, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord. And I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and he will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against these nations round about. And I will utterly destroy them, and I will make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Verse 11, it says, And the whole land will be, des- will be a desolation and a horror then these nations will serve the king of Babylon, and say it with me, 70 years. How many people know we should be moved by the scriptures? There are two things that Daniel was moved by. He was moved to pray deeper by the scriptures, and he was moved to pray by world events, national happenings. You know, how many people are moved to pray when you watch the news or read the, the newspaper? You should, you should be burdened. You know, how many, people, how many people are glad that there are no wars on our land right now? Is there anybody else that lives with me in South Jersey? Is there anybody here that, that is happy that there are not riots happening in South Jersey? You know what I mean? How many people know when you re- see it on the news, New York City looks really far away? The Midwest looks really far away. Yeah. And how many people are, are, are happy that there are not people, um, how, people um, picketing in our streets and stopping traffic around here? Okay? Yeah. And it's very easy to say, well, it's not in my neighborhood. But we should be moved by the things that are happening in the world. There should be no, no crisis that happens that doesn't affect and move us to deeper prayer. And yes, it might not affect us personally, what's happened in New York City, or what's happened in Oklahoma, or, or, or Indiana, or any other state. But w- we, need to, we need to, as Daniel, we need to have a, 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 an attitude that's going to pray and collectively, collectively take the weight of the burdens that are on people, whether it's around the world or it's in our country. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but, but, but Daniel took this, this, this prophecy and he, it caused him to go pray and seek the face of God. I'd like to share a big truth right now. Now think about this for a second. God said that there would be a judgment and that's exactly what happened. Judgment came to Israel. Just like Jeremiah said, prophesied years before, Nebuchadnezzar came when Daniel was around 17 years old and he destroyed Israel, completely destroyed it, and took captives just like the prophecy said. And now it says that after 70 years, the children of Israel are going to be released to go back home. And so Daniel is doing counting on his fingers and he's saying, we're coming to 70 years. It's coming up to that time. Now, how many people believe that God is sovereign? How many people believe that God doesn't need your help? How many people believe that God's in control over all things? How many people believe that God will establish his kingdom? How many people believe that you can't expect to fight God and win? That he's just big God, he's going to do what big God does and be God. Somebody say amen. Daniel believed that. But he, he, he facilitated that truth differently than many of us do. He believed that God was sovereign and he rules and controls the affairs of men. And he used that truth to, to jump into history. 
to jump, to jump into uh, current events through prayer and fasting and, and be part of the solution to bring about the will of God. Did you hear what I said? It wasn't a case of our, or our attitude. It wasn't, well, God, you're sovereign. You said that judgment was coming. It did. You said that deliverance would come. It's going to come. So I'm going to just sit back here and wait for my deliverance. No, he jumped into history through prayer and fasting. He literally, he literally dove in. Do you remember I said one of the most outstanding parts of who Daniel was? That he controlled both the hand of man and the hand of God. He moved the hand of man and the hand of God through prayer and fasting. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 3, going back to Daniel chapter 9. This is his reaction to finding out that the deliverance was come. He says, I gave my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. How did he respond to knowing that there was going to be deliverance? It wasn't like, pack my bags. It was like, let's get down and dirty in prayer. Somebody say amen. So he gave his attention. He gave his attention. How many people know if you don't give your attention to spiritual things, there are so many other things pulling at you. There are so many other things knocking at your door. If you, I can get, you know, it's funny. Um, when I was a young kid, I got saved when I was 16. And as a young person, I learned to pray and to fast and to seek God. And when I decided to fast, almost every time I decided to fast, my mom made lasagna. I'm, I'm, no, seriously, no fish. I love lasagna, and it wasn't like she knew I, she, she was making it because she knew I was fasting because I tried not to tell her because she didn't understand about fasting. Not saying that that was a good practice at 16 years old, but how many people know we learn? And, um, but almost every time. And now, Daniel's commitment to pray and to seek the face of God, what he, had, he resolved in his heart to do it. What is your level of commitment? Are you going to pray until somebody cooks the lasagna? You're going to fast until there's, there's something that you don't want to give up? Or are you going to set your heart to seek God? Amen. God is good. Um, verse 4, it says, And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and um, awesome God who keeps his covenant of loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity, act, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from the commandments and the ordinance. It goes on and on. And we, we see here that when Daniel heard that there was going to be deliverance, he knew that judgment came because of their sins. And so he goes into a prayer mode, and a prayer mode of confessing the sins of the nation. But I want you to notice, when he confessed the sins, he didn't say they did this, and they were idolaters, and they were bad. He confessed it like, Lord, we've done it. Daniel was willing to take, just like Jesus took the burden of the nation, Daniel was willing through the prayer to take the burden of the sin of the nation and to pray it through. Lord, we've done this. I'm part of this nation. If they've done it, I've done it. Does anybody understand that? Um, how many people know if your children hurt, you hurt? And there's a place in that, in prayer, that you can get if your nation hurts, if your community hurts, if your family hurts, you should hurt. Lord, I, I'm hurting about this. You know, if our nation is in our unrest, I should be on our unrest. Can somebody say amen? And we should dig down in prayer until we see God heal some of the ro roots. I want you to know the politicians don't have the answers. They don't have the cures. If it doesn't come from God, it's not going to last. Hallelujah. But we are the people. Hallelujah. If we are called by his name, we can come. Confess the sins of the nation. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And God is calling us. Hallelujah. He's calling us to, to pray over a nation. And I'm not going to have time to really go into chapter 9, but I would encourage you to read chapter 9 and also chapter 10 and, and, and see the, 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 the humility and the depths of his prayers. But we can also confess personal sins. The Bible says that to confess our sins to him because he, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and forgive us 
from all unrighteousness. The Bible says personally, if somebody says they are without sin, that they are a liar and the truth is not in them. And we need to look at our lives and we need to be real. and We need to look at the lives where we have changed. We think we're growing emotionally, but maybe we're growing in compromise. Maybe we're, we're growing away from the heart of God. And we need, to, we need to get down dirty during these 21 days and ask God to, to whip out the veil, to open the veil so we could see our lives with honesty and truth. And Lord, is there, is there a compromise or a sin in my life? If there's a weight in my life, Lord, Lord, help me to, to run away from that. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And that's what Daniel did. He confessed the sin of their nation. And we need to pray over our personal lives, our family lives, our church lives, our, our whole nation. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Um, I just want to briefly go into chapter 10. In chapter 10, we, we see it's now a, a new king. It's in the third year of King Cyrus, the king of Persia. Verse 1 of chapter 10, it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a messenger was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. And the message was true one, and one of great conflict. But he understood the message and had an understanding of the, of the vision. This is one thing I want to bring out to you. Daniel was willing to get, be disturbed. How many people know people that live in the cloud? Nothing bothers them. And there's a way to walk in peace in bad situations. I'm not talking about this. God was revealing that judgment was going to come upon the world. And Daniel was willing to get down and get into that prayer. He was willing to allow the burdens that God saw to be his burden to pray it through. And this is what it says. It says, in those days I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. Now I want you to get something really cool. Three weeks are how many days? 21 days, and we're supposed to be praying and fasting for how many days? 21. Guess where it came from? Daniel. And again, nobody has to. There's no lore. But the reason we, we picked 21 days is because that was the, the amount of time that Daniel sought the Lord for 21 days. Okay, do you understand that? Nothing superstitious, just fun. Okay, in those days I mourned for three entire weeks. Listen, this is how he fasted. I did not eat any tasty food. How many people know what tasty food is? Tasty food. Amen. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. For 21 days, he didn't eat the things that he liked the best. How many people could get excited about not having your favorite foods? Come on. It's going to be great, man. We're not going to eat our favorite things. I'm not going to have any chocolate. I'm not going to have any snacks. I love my snacks. You know, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And, um, and, um, and, and we could get excited when we know why we're doing it. And we know what we're running after. Hallelujah. And there is, there is no tasty morsel that could bless me more than one one speck of the anointing of God and one, one part of the blessing of God. And so he, he didn't eat meat, he didn't drink any wine, and he didn't put on ointment, meaning he didn't freshen himself up. Now, if you have to go to work, you better look the part, okay? And um, hallelujah. Um, hopefully next week we'll have the opportunity to look a little more into chapter 9 and 10 and Learn some things about spiritual warfare. But let me just say this. Please, as polite as I can, please join me for 21 days. Over the years, we've taken this very serious. On Tuesday night, we have like seven or eight prayer meetings. If a whole bunch of people don't go to different prayer meetings, no one's going to be there. So I'm asking you to please join us on the different nights to take 21 days and say for 21 days, I'm going to put as much time and effort into praying at home and going to as many prayer meetings as I can. I'm going to be seeking the face of God. I'm going to be making the sacrifices again, not that, I, that I'm doing. I'm going to ask God to show me the sacrifices that would be healthy for me to make. But I'm asking you to join me. And together we will see the kingdom of God. Together we will see his blessing. Together we'll see many people come to faith in Christ. 
Together we'll see many families brought back to unity. Marriages saved. Wayward children coming home. Wayward parents coming home. Because how many people know it goes both ways. We'll see God's grace and healings and blessings. How many people have family members that need more than just a little touch from God? Amen.